Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Thank you. My name is Arthur White, Director of External Affairs with Detroit Opera, uh, and welcome to this afternoon's pre-opera talk looking at Missy Mazzoli's Breaking the Waves. Now, uh, Missy Mazzoli and her uh, librettist, uh, Royce Vavrick, uh, have given us this heart-wrenching opera, which was inspired uh, by the Lars von Trier film of 1996. And it tells uh, the story of Bess, a woman in an extreme environment in Scotland in the 1970s, uh, and she's defying uh, her community of faith as well as all of those around her. Now this opera was commissioned uh, back in 2016 at Opera of Philadelphia and it sort of uh, packed off and went off to Europe for a few years and it's gotten an update uh, by Tom Morris. Uh, they've added some projections and some other technology uh, and so now it's returning triumphantly back to the U.S. with this performance here in Detroit. Now this production also marks the first main stage production at Detroit Opera which features an opera by a female composer. So this is something we are very excited about and we know that we will have many more to come. Uh, another thing that's exciting, yes. I'm also very excited about a couple of the guests that we have uh, to talk to you this afternoon. Uh, one of them uh, is the conductor uh, for today's performance. Uh, she has made uh, her Detroit Opera debut with this production of Breaking the Waves. Uh, this Franco-British conductor known for her strong ideas, lucid communication, and intensely focused energy on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, already this season, she has debuted for the Paris Opera Ballet, Hamburg State Opera. She's debuted with the Cleveland Orchestra just last month. Uh, after she leaves here in Detroit, she debuts at the Cincinnati Orchestra in May. She's in Sarasota Music Festival in June, uh, followed by that of the Prague State Opera, and her debut with the Detroit Symphony Orchestra in July. And so we are very thrilled that she is here. She'll be in conversation with Detroit Opera's music director. Uh, please welcome Roberto Kaub and Stephanie, uh, uh, Stephanie Childress. I don't know why I just had a blank. Sorry about that. The, both, my, both maestros. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank Sorry you about that. That's all right. <laughs> a break. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? This is my favorite crowd. The pe people that come to the pre-concert talks, you're the best. Um, so if you are fans of Wagner and you've seen a ring cycle, this might be a little bit like that because we spoke in this format two days ago. So if you go watch the ring cycle, if you get to Siegfried about one fourth of the way through, it's like previously on the ring cycle. You know? <laughs> so previously, Stephanie gave us a very beautiful backstory to her beginnings as a musician. So maybe you can repeat that for this audience. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. When outside, it's so gorgeous and sunny. I think I'd be sunbathing myself if I didn't have to conduct this gorgeous work. Um, a quick backstory um, as to how I became a musician. Um, I come from a, a sort of non-musical family. My parents are not in, in the classical music, not in the arts at all. Um, but I was always very fascinated by, by the arts and, you know, they gave me a lot of opportunities to go to museums, go to the ballet, theater, opera. So I was exposed to a lot from an early age. And um, I think from then on, uh, my interest in classical music really started at four, which is quite a young age, I will say. But um, I remember watching, I was taken to another one of these concerts that they used to take me to, and uh, it happened to be Nigel Kennedy playing The Four Seasons, which some of you might know. He's a very famous violinist, and he really popularized The Four Seasons. That was kind of a best-selling record, um, in a way, in the classical music world. He, even though the piece is hundreds and hundreds of years old, he sort of gave it a fresh, uh, a fresh makeover, so to speak. And I remember seeing him sort of bouncing around the stage, uh, playing this amazing piece and having this amazing energy that he still has. And I remember thinking, gosh, I kind of want to learn a bit more about that and about the two bits of wood that he's sort of scraping together, um, obviously making a very nice sound. Um, and that's how I started the violin and everything sort of snowballed from there. Great. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about Breaking the Waves. And... A few months ago, I was giving a talk, and I said, if you're going to go watch Breaking the Waves, uh, you're probably the person that goes into your Netflix and chooses, you know, 
psychological drama. <laughs> you know, it's not, a, you know, you didn't go comedy to arrive to this show today. Although there are a few bits of comedy, actually, uh, very good ones. Uh, can you give us a brief synopsis about what this piece is about, what happens? You don't necessarily have to give us the spoiler at the end if you don't want to. Um, well, I kind of want to give the spoiler <laughs> at the end now. Sorry, I won't. I'll refrain. Um, but if any of you have been to, to um, operas before, um, usually the same thing happens to the female character. I won't tell you what that is, but at the end something happens very often. And there's no exception with this. I think what's, um, what strikes me about this work, perhaps in opposition to previous operas in the canon, if you think of a lot of Verdi's heroines and um, you know, even some heroines in Wagner, for example, um, is that she really knows herself. She absolutely knows what she wants, and it's quite sad to witness the people around her pushing her in different directions and, and um, in a way, oppressing her freedom. And I think, you know, the fact that she is a woman is obviously very pertinent, but it, for me, it begs um, a bigger question, and it poses a bigger question as to, you know, each other's personal freedoms and how sometimes you can infringe on that. Um, it's obviously a very big topic, but um, for me it also represents hundreds and hundreds, not if not thousands of years of um, misogyny and um, the way that people can oppress a woman if they are a man and also if they are a woman. This is not, um, you know, there's no differentiation, I think, between the sexes. I think that's what Missy, in choosing this story is, and Royce as well, that's what the way in which they are really turning this idea of um, a woman in opera on its head. And I, that's the thing that I find the most intriguing about this story, even musically. You know, of course I deal with the music, but music is drama. And so that's my, my way of entering into the narrative is, you know, trying to find the angle that Missy and Royce uh, are trying to, to portray. And it's a very singular angle, and I hope you feel that as well. So musically, there are these very entertaining videos on YouTube, if you haven't seen, where it's five levels of explanation on any given subject. So it's, they're talking about the, the relativity. And the first level is they explain it to like a kindergartner. And then at the fifth level, they explain it to a fellow physicist, something like that. So maybe you can do this for us a little bit musically. How would you describe this piece in, in Missy's language? So you don't have to do the five levels. So let's do maybe like the first level is somebody that's never been to an opera, doesn't know what a chord is, what a minor chord, any, any theory, and then give us the like the nerdiest musicologist's explanation of like what her sound world is like. All right. I don't know if I'd be able to give that, but um, I don't know, maybe the posh British accent will help fool you. Um, <laughs> The, so the first level, I would say, is that um, try and think of color. What colors do you hear when we are playing this music? Do you hear blue? Do you hear red? I think her music is very, um, her music is very atmospheric. That might be a bit of a platitude, but I, I do think there is something to it. You know, if you look at the story it, itself and the way that it's set in Scotland in a very remote location, does it make you feel isolated? Does it make you feel like you're a part of a community? Does it make you feel lonely? I think, for me, the first level, as you say, and it's something that even uh, I, as a professional musician, always refer back to, is how does it make me feel? Um, and if you can tap into that and learn how to be descriptive, and um, I think it's even a form of meditation in a way, learning how to tap into yourself, um, into your mind particularly, and say, how does this make me feel? So that would be the most basic level. Um, basic, but also obviously not basic. And um, I guess on a more complex well, a level of high complexity, I would say that the orchestral textures for me are very interesting, particularly the use of the electric guitar, which I hope you will hear. Sometimes it's a part of the orchestral texture. Sometimes it sort of pops out to create a very jarring effect. It's obviously an instrument that you wouldn't necessarily 
uh, always here in a symphonic context, let alone an operatic context. So I think that's quite uh, amazing. And another thing I would love for you to listen out to, those of you who know Wagner's music particularly, would be the way that she uses the strings sometimes to conjure up these sort of waves and the swells in the sea and that darkness as well that we know lies underneath uh, a sometimes very quiet and peaceful surface. I don't feel like that's very complex. I feel I'm just talking about emotions and images, but that's kind of what we deal with as conductors. So I hope that's a bit useful. Very good. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about characters in the opera. And in some operas, there are certain characters that have trajectories and development and change um, if those of you that are fans of Bohème, those that came to see our famous reverse Bohème, which I was conducting, was a lot of fun. Um, basically, the main characters, I mean, this, some people might discuss with me, but Rodolfo and Mimi really don't change too much within the opera. They just love each other, and then she dies, and he still loves her, and it's very much like this. But really, Musetta is this, the character that has this beautiful arc and that actually in our production we saw in reverse. We saw this very complex, complex character at the beginning of the opera and then we went back in time and realized what she was like in the beginning of the opera. Is there a particular character in this opera that has a nice trajectory of change or do you think they sort of stay the same? Terry. <laughs> No, sorry. It's a bit of a. It's become a bit of an inside joke within the whole company. Terry is the um, played by the fabulous Bobby Mellon. Is the um, he's kind of uh, the lighter side of the opera. And so I don't know if he has a, a huge personal trajectory, but I hope you enjoy his performance nonetheless. I think the person who really goes on a journey, for me personally, is actually. Um, I mean, I, I would have said Bess maybe at the start of this process, but I think Jan, um, her husband, her lover, her husband, um, even though he is technically um, very much mentally, let's say, impaired through the accident that he's involved in, mentally altered for a part of the production, I think that the journey he, the destination that he arrives at at the end of the opera is something that, in a way, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, but also clearly has changed his life and will change his life for the better um, through Bess's sacrifice and through her actions. Um, so maybe think about, meditate on that for a bit and after, let me know your own thoughts. I asked you something similar the last time, but I want to be very specific about a musical moment that's your favorite and if we can tie it with whatever is happening on stage so that they, they know exactly like, you know, when, when this happens on stage so that they can listen, what would you ask the audience to listen for in a particular dramatic moment? I do have a favorite musical moment and um, I've shared this with the orchestra, I've shared this with the cast. It's a moment of absolute pure simplicity in act two. I think the beginning of act two when Bess goes to visit Jan, her husband, um, in the hospital and going into some sort of slightly nerdy details, we have um, a beautiful suspension that is resolved. A suspension is when you have um, a chord that you feel is unstable and it's prolonged and you can feel that tonal instability. You can nearly feel it physically and then suddenly it's resolved and everything feels like it's in balance again. And there's, that happens to the words, please don't die, Jan. And the way that also Kira, our best, sings it, just, please don't, please don't die, Jan. Really just cajoling and caressing and trying to do everything she can in her power to, to keep the man that she loves alive. I think that's a really powerful moment. So if you can latch onto that, if you can identify it, um, it really is a gorgeous moment. Tell us a little bit about differences between symphonic conducting and opera conducting because you you're very lucky that you get to do a lot of both what are challenges with each of them tell us a little bit about that well the challenges are also the strengths in a way and the positives can become the negatives um what i love about opera is that you're normally rehearsing on a much longer period of time so for example here i was i've been here essentially a month and we've rehearsed that entire time 
Um, conversely, sometimes if you're on a project for too long, you feel like you've been on a project for too long. Um, and that's also the benefit of being a symphonic conductor is you get to be with an orchestra maybe for a week, maybe for two weeks at most if you're doing a tour. And that can be an incredibly fulfilling time. But um, again, on the flip side, sometimes you want it to last longer. Sometimes you don't feel as though you get to know the musicians enough within that short week or week and a half that you have with the orchestra. So it swings and roundabouts. Um, but for me, the repertoire is always very exciting. And I think if I have good repertoire, um, I can make it work, you know, whatever the circumstances, whether it's a short period of time or a long period of time. Would you say this is a challenging piece to conduct? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's challenging. It's challenging on a number of levels. Um, it looks very simple, and I think with all great music, you know, there's the saying that Mozart is one of the most difficult um, composers to conduct because his music is so simple. And it's not about what you do with it, but it's about letting the simplicity come through and allowing that simplicity to come through, not trying to crowd it with too much artifice or too much superficiality. And it's the same, I think, with Missy's music. I think also on the emotional level, I mean, this is a really heavily charged piece. It's something that we've all been carrying now for over a month. Um, that's not even including preparation, you know, prior to us entering the rehearsal room. It's a really heavy topic, and I think it's something that we've all had to um, be very aware of in relation to each other. We've all had to really support each other. We've all had moments of um, despair, of, you know, grief in the rehearsal room because it is such a heavy topic, and um, you do feel responsible for such a story and for people who go through similar things that Bess might, um, that Bess has gone through. Um, so that's responsibility and that's not one that we take lightly as artists. Okay, so before I turn it over to Arthur, uh, I want to, I mean, I'm so happy that Stephanie's here. She's a wonderful musician. You'll you'll see and you'll hear. Uh, and it's it's the, the beginnings of an incredible career, I believe, and so we're, I feel very, very lucky that we get to experience her U.S. opera debut, correct? Yes, here at Detroit Opera, yes. <laughs> now, a, a side note here, <laughs> this is for me. Uh, if you leave this opera uh, and you have a, a feeling of despair, you're very sad and depressed, you're You've admired the performances, but it's, it's a little rough, yeah? It gets a little intense. I have the perfect antidote for all of you, <laughs> okay? Coming up, May 11th, 17th, and 19th, The Cunning Little Vixen. It's animals on stage. It's really cheerful. There is a sad part, but I'm not going to spoil it. A tiny, <laughs> tiny bit at the end, yeah. But... The music is gorgeous. Please don't miss it. It's going to be fantastic. It's Yuval's production that's uh, with projections and the characters put their heads through the wall and there's like little cartoons. Bring your teenagers, kids, everything. Don't miss it, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Thank you Stephanie, Arthur. for being with us once again. And we'll let you get back to prepare for today's performance. Actually, Maestro Kyle, would you stay up actually with me? Maybe we'll... Uh, so we'll let you slide through. Thank you. All right. Yeah, so maybe have you hang with me here. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our next uh, uh, guest. She's an American scholar of music. She is the David G. Frey Distinguished Professor in Music at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She's also the first scholar in residence of the Seattle Opera and the Des Moines Metro Opera. Uh, she's no stranger to Michigan. She taught at the University of Michigan first, at the University of Michigan School of Music, Theater, and Dance, and then at the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts until she left for Chapel Hill. Uh, I first became aware of her uh, with her book, Black Opera, History, Power, and Engagement. Uh, also her, her book, uh, Voicing Gender, Castrari, Travesti, and the Second Woman in Early 19th Century Italian Opera. Uh, she's also a board member here at Detroit Opera and been an advisor. Uh, Dr. Naomi Andre, come right up if you would, my friend. <laughs> Thank you. Now I have to, I have to preface so this. Uh, so we were doing the pre-opera talk, just as we just did. Uh, I remember the conductor's name that time. And, uh, 
And so uh, you, I, I noticed you were in town. And yes. so I said, you've got to come up and share some of your perspective. So you saw the opera for the first time. Uh, I think you were familiar with the Vontures uh, film yes. back in 96. You were probably in middle school back in then, in those Thank days. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us what, uh, what you, your impressions about what you saw? Sure. I am speaking to you as somebody who loves opera. And for all of the newbies in here, hopefully this will be an experience that feels um, immersive and important. And for all of you who might have seen an opera or two, I have some comments and thoughts about sort of what makes this an incredible piece. The Opera House is a place where you have a lot of spectacle and it's an escape and all these wonderful things, but the Opera House is also another space where things happen. And today it will be a courageous and brave space. You know, we used to talk about safe spaces, but when we're talking about difficult issues around gender, around sexual um, harassment, sexual violence, when we're talking about wonderful things too, love and the intimacy of love, we need a space, like it's wonderful the Opera House can transform and become a place that brings these things. So I've got two big sort of takeaways um, from seeing the opera, because this is an opera from 2016. It's not like you can just check out a score and get a recording. Um, so I had seen the film by Lars von Trier from 1996, but I came to the opera hearing wonderful things about it, but not knowing too much. And the first thing, there are two big things that jumped out at me. The first thing, which I'll spend a few moments on, is this issue of intimacy, and intimacy on multiple levels in this work. There's the intimacy that is physically depicted on stage. For those of you who've been to the Opera House, I can't think of another opera where there is singing through sexual actions. <laughs> I don't really know how else to say it. Sometimes you might go to an opera and there's a production that's kind of risque. We all love Zalame at the end with the Dance of the Seven Veils. Is she gonna take her clothes off or not? But that's sort of up to the director's discretion. Here, there is a scene in Shostakovich's Lady Macbeth of the Mid-Sense District, but you can get away with not seeing sexual actions happening. This is an opera that is really a millennial opera, written for now, and we see this on stage. But it's not just the physical actions that are there, there's the orchestration that gives us an intimacy, especially around Bess's music, I think. She is, as you'll hear with um, our singer, Kira Duffy, she has a very high light coloratura soprano voice, and it could easily be overshadowed and drowned out by the orchestra, and given our incredibly wonderful conductors who think about this and what Stephanie Childress does, but also Missy Mazzoli's writing, there's a real tenderness and gentleness around her music that also connects with her voice. There's also the tenderness with Bess as a character. We're really not too sure about her. At different times, we find out that she takes medication. At different times, she speaks to God. Um, so we're not too sure who she is, what is going on there. But you never, or I didn't feel, I mean, I'll see it for the second time today, I didn't feel that she was somebody who was malevolent or even not fully grounded, though we can certainly talk about that. There's a closeness and tenderness between Bess and her sister-in-law, Dodo. There's a real friendship, and those friendships are not entirely absent from the opera canon, but we don't get enough of them. And here you see sort of these two women. This is an opera that has a lot of men. There are three women, Bess, her sister-in-law, Dodo, and then Bess's mother. And then you have this large church um, congregation, the elders, they're not always um, enlightened about what Bess needs or what women in the congregation might need. But there's this wonderful friendship with Bess and Dodo. And then I think what we witness in the audience of Bess's relationship with Jan, the person she is in love with and who marries, and there's a real tenderness and intimacy there, and Bess's relationship with God. We have Bess talking to God, 
and that's always, but it's voiced through her, and there's some interesting things in the orchestra, and it's when she sings low, which is very unusual for bass. And then we have her sort of soaring up above, which is interesting, because you think of celestial voices in opera, Don Carlos, Aida, Tonhoi, like, different things, and they're usually these high soaring voices, but here it's Bess who's given almost a celestial voice. And um, God is given almost a more masculine voice through the elders and then Bess and her down in the basement in the lower range. Yeah. You had made another comment when our earlier conversation, uh, uh, Dr. Andre, uh, about going, thinking back to this opera has some, you, you, one opera jumped out at you, I think it was Lucia. Could you it tell us, did. talk to about that? I stood up at the end of, well, actually at the intermission, and I was like still thinking, wow, this is pretty intense, lots of stuff going on. And then I thought, Lucia, Lucia. So here, and uh, for those of you who don't know Donizetti's 1835 opera, Lucia de Lamamor, it's um, a, usually performed a lot. It's one you'll get a chance to see or you can get videos of it. It's an opera that um, was for the Teatro San Carlo in Naples, a very conservative theater, with their house poet, the librettist Salvadore Camarano. And this was popular when it was first performed in 1835 and continued to be throughout the 19th century and even through the 20th and into the 21st century. This is an opera based on Sir Walter Scott's 1819 novel, The Bride of Lammermoor. And we have a setting in Scotland. This opera is set in Scotland. We have a large male chorus in Lucia de Lammermoor. And there's a large male chorus here with the um, very few women. Lucia de Lamamor, she has um, a, a maid, like an assistant, um, no mother there. Mothers are absent in a lot of traditional operas, so it's really nice to have mothers popping in the 21st century. And we also have, yeah, you know, it takes a little while, but finally we're getting operas that reflect things that kind of relate to um, our experiences today. I mean, they all relate to our experiences, but today we need to put more mothers in operas. Um, we have special musical associations that in Lucia de Lamamor, the harp is given a wonderful solo in her first act aria, Regnava nel silencio. Um, and then the harp plays throughout here. It's such an important instrument. And then perhaps the most famous um, instrument connected with Lucia is during her act three, Mad Scene, which is the flute. And the flute also comes out to prominence at different points here. I know we've got, we're running out of time, but I'll just make a couple of, one last comment about the Lucia. You know, and these other things, the Scotland, the um, large male chorus, the harp and the flute, um, high coloratura heroines. I think the most important thing to me is that both Lucia and Bess are oppressed by their patriarchal societies around them. They both try to resist, and without giving too much of um, a spoiler alert, they're both ultimately undone. Yet there's something that feels very modern in this opera, bringing these issues of what it means to be a woman, what it means to express love, what it means to express femininity, what it means to have your own opinions, what it means to be connected to a church, to family. It feels like a very contemporary take on a lot of things we've seen in opera before. Missy Mazzoli has done an amazing job, and you get to witness a really important work. Dr. Naomi Andre, I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you so much. And thank you again for just having me drag you up I here. I know. This is, <laughs> I wrote down a couple of notes. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you, uh, Maestro. You're going to have a wonderful performance. Thank you all so much for being here. We'll see you uh, for Vixen after this production. <laughs>